In sociology, the post-industrial society is a stage of society's development when the service sector generates more wealth than the manufacturing sector of the economy. The term was originated by Elaine Turing and is closely related to similar sociological theoretical constructs such as post-Fordism, information society, knowledge economy, post-industrial economy, liquid modernity, and network society. They all can be used in economics or social science disciplines as a general theoretical backdrop in research design. As the term has been used, a few common themes, including the ones below have begun to emerge. 1. The economy undergoes a transition from the production of goods to the provision of services. 2. Knowledge becomes a valued form of capital, see human capital. 3. Producing ideas is the main way to grow the economy. 4. Through processes of globalization and automation, the value and importance to the economy of blue-collar, unionized work, including manual labor, for example, assembly line work, decline, and those of professional workers, for example, scientists, creative industry professionals, and IT professionals, grow in value and prevalence. 5. Behavioral and information sciences and technologies are developed and implemented. For example, behavioral economics, information architecture, cybernetics, game theory and information theory. Daniel Bell popularized the term through his 1974 work The Coming of Post-Industrial Society. Although some have credited Bell with coining the term, French sociologist Alain Turain published in 1969 the first major work on the post-industrial society. The term was also used extensively by social philosopher Ivan Illich in his 1973 paper Tools for Conviviality, and appears occasionally in leftist texts throughout the mid to late 1960s. The term has grown and changed as it became mainstream. The term is now used by admin such as Seth Godin, public policy PhD such as Keith Bokelman, and sociologists such as Neil Fligstein and Ofer Sharon. President Bill Clinton even used the term to describe Chinese growth in a roundtable discussion in Shanghai in 1998. The post-industrialized society is marked by an increased valuation of knowledge. This itself is unsurprising having been foreshadowed in Daniel Bell's presumption as to how economic employment patterns will evolve in such societies. He asserts employment will grow faster in the tertiary and quaternary sector relative to employment in the primary and secondary sector and that the tertiary and quaternary sectors will take precedence in the economy. This will continue to occur such that the impact of the expert will expand and power will be monopolized by knowledge. As tertiary and quaternary sector positions are essentially knowledge-oriented, this will result in a restructuring of education, at least in its nuances. The new power of the expert consequently gives rise to the growing role of universities and research institutes in post-industrial societies. Post-industrial societies themselves become oriented around these places of knowledge production and production of experts as their new foci. Consequently, the greatest beneficiaries in the post-industrial society are young urban professionals. As a new, educated, and politicized generation more impassioned by liberalism, social justice, cultural Marxism, and environmentalism radicalized conservationism the shift of power into their hands, as a result of their knowledge endowments, is often cited as a good thing. The increasing importance of knowledge in post-industrial societies results in a general increase in expertise through the economy and throughout society. In this manner, it eliminates what Alan Banks and Jim Foster identify as undesirable work as well as the grosser forms of poverty and inequality. This effect is supplemented by the aforementioned movement of power into the hands of young educated people concerned with social justice, cultural Marxism. Paul Romer, a professor of economics at Stanford, revolutionized the appreciation of knowledge as a valuable asset. As he says it is not just the ingredients, supply, that makes good food, it is the recipe, knowledge, that counts too. Better recipe, better food means better knowledge, more economic growth.
Economists at Berkeley have studied the value of knowledge as a form of capital, adding value to material capital, such as factory or a truck. Speaking along the same lines of their argument, the addition or production of knowledge could become the basis of what would undoubtedly be considered post-industrial policies meant to deliver economic growth. Similarly, post-industrial society has serviced the creative culture. Many of those most well-equipped to thrive in an increasingly technological society are young adults with tertiary education. As education itself becomes more and more oriented towards producing people capable of answering the need for self-actualization, creativity, and self-expression, successive generations become more endowed with the ability to contribute to and perpetuate such industries. This nuanced change in education, as well among the emerging class of young professionals, is itself initiated by what James D. Wright identifies as an unprecedented economic affluence and the satiation of basic material needs. Ellen Dunham Jones as well observes this feature of post-industrial society where abundant goods equitably distributed laborless leisure and self-determination can be consumed.